Okay, I think I'll start now. I'll let everyone else trickle in as they come. Um, so, hi, my name is Lawrence. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'll be presenting on high flow uh, nasal cannula. So, this is um, something I've uh, used, seen used more and more often, especially when I rotated through my IC rotations earlier this year. So, I thought it would be a good time to uh, review this topic uh, in the context of the emergency department setting. Uh, so before I begin, I, I don't really have any conflicts of interest to declare, but I will be mentioning the company that manufactures the high flow machines that we use here at LHSC. So here are the list of objectives I hope to cover today. Uh, so first of all, I want to describe the mechanism action of high flow. Uh, the second objective is to describe the practical considerations of uh, starting high flow in the emergency department. Uh, thirdly, I want to identify the role of high flow in PEDS patients, um, specifically more so in bronchiolytics, and also for adults uh, in the use of high flow in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and in other applications as well. And I'm going to focus on, on more of uh, aptic oxygenation for uh, patients. So I guess uh, my hope is that by the end of this presentation, we'll have some time to kind of generate some discussion about whether we should be considering using high flow uh, more often here at LHSC, uh, whether or not it be more feasible uh, for us uh, and how comfortable each of us would feel about starting high flow. So I'll, I'll come back to the slide at the end of our, um, my presentation and I'll just maybe open up for discussion later. So I'll start off with a case first. Um, so this is a question I'll have for the, any of the plus one eMERGE residents here. Um, so the case is you have a 65 year old gentleman admitted to Strathroy Hospital for pneumonia. You're a community eMERGE doc on your night shift. So you're covering the whole hospital. You're the only doc there. Uh, you get called up onto the floor by the nurse and she's concerned about this patient's oxygen saturation on the monitor. Uh, so the question I have for the plus one residents is uh, what type of respiratory failure do you think this patient is presenting with? And if this patient was on a vent, um, how do you think we can fix this? Hey, it's Mason. Um, so I don't see uh, anywhere where we see uh, the, uh, the, the waveform capnography, but I mean, I definitely there's a hypoxic uh, respiratory failure component. If they're on a vent, I would uh, titrate up the FiO2 as well as the uh, PEEP in accordance with probably the ARGENET uh, protocol for that. Although I guess you can be a little more aggressive with the PEEP depending on what your thoughts are. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, there's two ways you can improve oxygenation on the vent settings, uh, and that's by either increasing your FiO2 or by increasing your PEEP. So in order to really understand how increasing your FiO2 improves your oxygenation, you have to think back to basically medical school when we learned about the alveolar gas equation. So I have it on the top there. Uh, so in this equation, the PaO2, so your partial pressure of alveolar oxygen, is uh, directly proportional to FiO2. So basically what that means is increasing your FiO2 means you're increasing the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus. Um, so this is important because if you remember Henry's law, uh, so back in physics in my undergrad, the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas above the surface of solution, as you can see at the equation below. Um, so if we were to apply this to the lung, uh, so the higher the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus, uh, the higher the solubility in the bloodstream, which would lead to better oxygenation. Uh, so another way we can improve oxygenation is by increasing PEEP. So PEEP, uh, basically, what it does is it can help improve the VQ mismatches in a lung when someone has pneumonia. And how it does that is by it can open the airways by splinting them open and recruiting parts of the lung that may otherwise be collapsed. So that would lead to decreased atelectasis, improving alveolar ventilation and oxygenation. So I think it's important to uh, quickly mention that FiO2, so the fraction of inspired oxygen, varies depending on the elevation you're at. So at sea level here, you can see that the FiO2 is around 21%. Uh, but you can see that as you go higher and higher in elevation, um, you drop your FiO2. So at 8,000 meters, uh, which is probably the close to the height of the Everest, uh, your equivalent FiO2 is roughly 8%. 
So when we're talking about oxygen delivery devices, I find it's easier to uh, classify them by their flow rates. Um, so on one end of the spectrum, you have your low flow devices, which include your nasal cannulas, your simple partial face masks. On, on the other end of the spectrum, you have your high flow devices, which include your venturi masks, your non rebreather masks with reservoirs, and your high flow nasal cannula. So I'm gonna go over quickly all these, uh, these different devices. So starting off with nasal cannulas, uh, so I think a common misunderstanding a lot of people have is confusing oxygen flow with oxygen concentration, uh, which in fact, uh, they are actually independent of each other. So for all oxygen devices, the patient's not just breathing in direct oxygen, um, but rather they're breathing in a mixture or a combination of room air plus the oxygen from the device. So in the case of a nasal cannula here, so every liter you can see you increase um, you increase the FiO2 by roughly 4% up to a maximum of 44% because you max out at six liters on uh, nasal prongs. So similarly uh, for face masks, uh, like simple face masks, you can increase, uh, you can deliver, sorry, FiO2 at various rates, but because of the imperfect fit and the venting holes, you can see that I highlighted in red, uh, these allow like room air to be mixed in with the air that you're giving from the, the wall. So consequently, the max FiO2 you're getting is roughly 60 to 70%. So what makes a non-rebreather mask with a reservoir a bit different is that it contains that bag, reservoir bag, and one way valves, which you can see here in the red. Uh, so the valves help control the flow of uh, carbon uh, dioxide um, out so that it prevents the patient from inhaling their expired air. Therefore, the max FiO2 you can get is roughly between 75 to 90%. Um, so I'm going to be spending much more time talking about the mechanism of high flow, uh, but what makes high flow unique compared to other oxygen delivery devices is that in addition to adjusting the flow rates, uh, you can actually adjust the percentage of FiO2 you can deliver, and also you can warm the humidified air that you deliver as well. Um, and also you can also have a max flow rate of up to 60 liters per minute with high flow. Compare that to like a max flow rate of roughly 15 liters per minute uh, for a non-rebreather mask. And lastly, although it's still a bit controversial in the literature, you can also get small amounts of PEEP, uh, roughly three to five. And this is achieved by a uh, patient closing your mouth and creating a closed circuit. So how does high flow work and what are its advantages compared to other oxygen delivery devices? So when I was doing my literature review, there was a lot of information out there, but what I found most helpful was this acronym that I got from the Rebel EM website. Uh, so over the next few slides, I'm gonna go over what each of these uh, mean. So the first advantage of high flow is that it can be heated and humidified. And although this might not seem like a big deal, it's actually quite useful, uh, especially for patients going through high flow and for PEDS patients as well. So for example, the air coming from a nasal cannula is often cold and dry. And studies have shown that this could lead to airway inflammation by increasing airway resistance, uh, decreasing mucociliary ciliary function, decreasing secretion clearance, and increasing calorie consumption. So if you can imagine like stepping outside your house in the middle of the winter storm and trying to take a deep breath in versus like stepping outside during the summertime, you can really start to understand how uncomfortable it would be for patients who are trying to tolerate a flow rate of 60 liters per minute without any humidity or any warmth. So another advantage of high flow, uh, I guess when you compare to other devices, uh, is the ability for it to match the inspiratory demands, especially during high output states like uh, respiratory distress. So when I was kind of looking into this kind of topic, I was confused of what inspiratory demands mean. Um, and I guess to better understand what it means, it's important to firstly define like what peak inspiratory flow rate is, uh, which is the maximal flow rate, so liters it per minute obtained during each breath. So the normal peak inspiratory flow rate for you and me at rest is roughly, I think, 20 to 30 liters per minute. And as you can imagine, if you're in some sort of acute respiratory failure, or let's say you're sprinting, that flow rate's gonna increase dramatically. So it goes up to maybe 60 to 120 liters per minute. And the issue with face masks is that the max flow rate it can deliver it can only go up to 15 liters per minute. So if your body actually needs 60 to 120 liters per minute, just a simple face mask is not going to be able to match your actual body's demands. 
So another way high flow is beneficial for patients is that it can provide PEEP. And although this is still a bit controversial in the literature, so what some studies have shown is that for every 10 liters you increase in flow per minute, you actually can increase PEEP by one. Um, so you can increase up to people like five or six, that's the max you can get from high flow. And what PEEP does is, it, like I said before, it recruits alveoli, therefore increases the functional residual capacity of the lung, which is defined as the volume air present in lungs at the end of passive expiration. So another added benefit of high flow is that it's much more comfortable compared to a tight fitting CPAP and BiPAP mask. And I think this is pretty self-explanatory because I'm sure everyone has seen a patient and emerge try to rip off uh, their BiPAP mask and so it's not comfortable at all. So there also, also have been studies that have shown higher compliance with high flow compared to uh, leading to improvement uh, to oxygenation and uh, work of breathing. So another benefit of high flow is the ability to improve O2 dilution. So this is a bit tricky uh, concept to explain, but if you can imagine the normal minute ventilation of a person at rest is roughly five to eight liters per minute. But in respiratory failure, um, because you're breathing quicker, your minute ventilation increases up to 20 liters per minute. So the best way I can illustrate of how O2 dilution works is if you look at the picture on the right. Uh, so if you start nasal prongs at, uh, in this person going at six liters per minute at FO2 of 45%, um, in the same person, this person is actually breathing in 20 liters per minute through their mouth at 21%, so the FO2 of room air. So the actual, actual FO2 reaching your lungs is not going to be like 45%. It's going to be mixed in with the air you're breathing in, which is at larger volumes. Uh, in reality, it's going to be closer to 21%. Um, so the advantage of the high flow in this instance is that you can deliver 100% FO2 up to 60 liters per minute. Uh, so at higher volumes, you would be getting less of that uh, O2 dilution effect. So lastly, uh, what high flow does really well is washing out the anatomical dead space. Uh, so to explain this concept, each breath you take contains a mixture of inhaled and exhaled air. Uh, however, as you breathe in quicker and quicker, that amount of gas you exhale starts to becoming less and less. So consequently, you're actually starting to breathe in more CO2 and less O2 with every breath. So high flow is great because the continuous high flow actually washes out the anatomical dead space in the upper areas, so like in the picture to your right, and replaces the CO2 with O2. Uh, so effectively what happens is that you can turn your anatomical dead space into an oxygen reservoir that's available for gas exchange. So just like the reservoir bag you would find in a non-rebreather uh, bag. I mean mask, sorry. So the second objective I want to talk about this morning is the is practical considerations of starting high flow in the emergency department, especially here at LHSC. So there are two main companies nowadays that produce uh, these high flow machines. Uh, so on the left, Fisher and Paco produces the air flow system that we find here at LHSC. Uh, and on the right, Vapotherm uh, produces a machine called Precision Flow. Uh, so the Airvo device has quite a few components. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of quickly go over them so people are a little bit more familiar when they see a device like this. So you have your actual Airvo device, which is that little like box you see in the middle of that picture. Um, and you have your Airvo tube and chamber kit. Um, so basically that is this little uh, chamber and this little uh, tube that attaches to the actual machine. Then you have your oxygen flow meter, which is capable of uh, 60 liters per minute of flow. And then you have your uh, patient interface, which I'm gonna go over in the next slide. And then you have your uh, sterile water, you have your oxygen tubing, and then you have your wheeled stand. So there are various uh, patient interfaces that the manufacturer produces. And these interfaces, at least for the Fisher and Paykel, are called OptiFlow, which is kind of confusing at first because the device itself uh, is actually called Airvo. Um, so the one that you'll most commonly use in your practice in the future is the on the left, and that's the one used for adults. It's secured over your nose, uh, just like a nasal prongs, a little bit tighter fitting, and it comes with an adjustable uh, head strap. So the one in the middle you see is actually a tracheostomy interface, and oftentimes uh, it's used for kids uh, with CF who are trached. And finally, there are different sizes for the PEDS interfaces, uh, depending on their weight, and each one has their own uh, max flow rates, which I'll go over in the next few slides. So 
I guess one of the criticisms I've heard from people about starting high flow in the merge department is that it's, it's expensive. Uh, so I was really curious to find out how much it actually costs at LHSC compared to the other devices we commonly use in the eMERGE department. So I was actually surprised to find out how much cheaper it was compared to BiPAP machines. As you can see here, it only costs $3,400 for the machine itself uh, versus $15,000 for the V60 uh, uh, non-invasive ventilator. And the ventilator uh, for intubation costs upward to $30,000. Um, and also, if you can see on the left, uh, the cost of the airflow circuit uh, and the interface uh, is also comparable to the uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, circuit and the mask as well. So they're like the BiPAP mask. So obviously when you compare to uh, a non-rebreather mask uh, and a nasal cannula, it's gonna be much more expensive. But I feel that like in the grand scheme of things for a high flow device, you're actually getting quite good value, especially if you can save a patient from uh, being intubated and then being admitted to the ICU setting. So I was also curious uh, to see how many high flow devices we actually have at LHSC and the breakdown in terms of who owns them here. So what I learned is that the critical care division actually owns 10 units, and this is shared uh, between the MSICU and CCTC. Uh, Respirology has 10 units on their floor at Vic. PETS has 10 units as well, and one of them is always in the merge department, the PETS merge, and the rest can be used either um, basically Right now, they can only use, be used in PICU, uh, but I heard that they, they're working on being able to use it at a B600, which is the general peds wards. Um, so what I also learned from Dr. Dagnoni is that our emerged department actually purchased 10 units of Airbo in the beginning of the spring this year in anticipation of the COVID surge. So currently they're not actually stored in the merge department, but if you were to ask an RT to bring one down, they would be able to. Um, they're stored centrally somewhere in the hospital. But the issue I think that most people are, who are starting um, patients in a high flow emerge is that these patients uh, will likely have to be admitted. And the current protocol right now at LHSC is to, uh, for these patients on high flow, they have to be admitted um, to either CCTC or the respirology floor um, at Victoria Hospital or MSICU at UH. So the challenge at this, I guess right now is of starting high flow is that you have to get approval from, from critical care before you do that. And that makes things a little bit more cumbersome. But uh, I guess looking forward, uh, what I heard is that there's a lot of discussion about uh, creating new protocols at LHSC so that patients can be admitted to the floor, uh, not necessary to the rest floor or CCTC. Uh, but as of now, this is still in flux, um, but I hope that's something that we can start pushing towards after uh, this talk here. Um, similarly, in PEDS Emerge, um, what I heard is that you also need the blessing of either PICU or PCOTS if you wanted to start uh, patients on high flow in the PEDS Emerge or on the PEDS wards as well. So in terms of indications for high flow in adults at LHSC, this was taken directly from the LHSC guidelines, the standard operating guidelines. Uh, and I'll be going over the evidence for the indications later. Uh, similarly for PEDS, this was taken from the LHSC guidelines as well. And speaking to the PEDS RT, uh, HIFO is mostly used, used in PEDS uh, ER for bronchiolytics, for asthmatics, for uh, Coopers, and a subset of uh, chronic CFRs uh, who are trait. So there is a bunch of contraindications for high flow. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but big picture wise, uh, you wouldn't want to start uh, using high flow in COPD or patients with um, hypercapnic respiratory or any like ventilation issues, because uh, as you know, high flow doesn't provide any ventilation. Um, you don't want to use it for uh, hypoperfusion respiratory failure or any untreated pneumothorax and patients with any um, anatomical injuries, such as like skull fractures or uh, nasal obstructions. So at LHC, we, uh, we do have the luxury of having RT available at all times during the day. But I guess for anyone who is planning to work in the community or in a rural eMERGE setting in the future, I think it's important to get yourself comfortable with uh, the AIRVO settings uh, because you could be stuck in a situation where you don't have an RT, which is very common, at least uh, where I did my family med training uh, as well. Um, so thankfully, it's not very hard to do this, to learn how to do this on AIRVO. Basically, you can see the screen here. You can set the dew point and the flow rates in the FiO2 and appears on the screen here. Um, you can also set it to a junior mode, so for pediatric patients, and you do this by pressing and holding the play button for a couple of seconds, and it'll beep and it'll change to a junior mode. 
So for um, standard of practice, you probably just want to set your dew point to be roughly uh, 31 to 37 degrees for adults. And if the patient tolerates, um, decrease it down to 31 to 34 uh, degrees. And for peds, you want to set your dew point between uh, 31 uh, to 34 degrees Celsius. So in terms of setting your initial flow rate um, for adults, this was taken directly from the LHC guidelines. So the general rule will be starting roughly 50 to 60 liters per minute, which is a max flow rate. And, and then you titrate down to your desired SpO2. Uh, in peds, uh, it's a little bit different. The max flow rates you see in red are dependent on the size of the ca nasal cannula, which is, in turn is dependent on the patient's weight. Um, but like adults, you generally want to max out on your flow rate first and titrate down once uh, you get your stable uh, flow rates uh, and to your desired uh, SpO2. So let's say you have a patient on high flow in the community emerge um, for the last two hours. Like, How do you know if high flow has failed and at what point should you start considering intubating your patient? Uh, so I think that's very important to recognize that firstly, high flow is an oxygen device and not a non-invasive ventilation device like BiPAP or an actual ventilator. Therefore, I think it's very important to know when to recognize when high flow is not working, especially in a community setting where you don't have an RT looking after uh, the patient for you. I think that's where the ROC score comes in handy. Uh, it was developed by uh, uh, intensivist to help predict the success or failure of the patient on high flow in the ICU setting. And it's calculated here, as you can see on the bottom right, as the ratio of SVO2 over FiO2 over respiratory rate. So for those of uh, who aren't really good at calculating like numbers on the fly, a power chart actually has a ROCS calculator built in. And for people who won't be practicing at LHSC or who like uh, apps instead, uh, Fisher & Paykel, the company that produces Airvo, actually has a ROCS calculator uh, app and it's available on iOS or a Google Play Store. Uh, unfortunately, I checked the MD Calc and they don't have the ROCS score uh, calculator yet. So this point in this slide is to show that LHCC actually incorporates a ROC score into their acute respiratory illness decision algorithm. And you can see that at various time points here, um, you have a ROC score below a certain threshold. Uh, the algorithm actually pushes you to intubate uh, the patient. So the next uh, objective I'm gonna go cover is identifying the role of high flow in PEDS patients. Um, so like I mentioned before, there are lots of indications for high flow peds. Uh, the one that's most studied and the one that I'm focusing on today is on bronchiolitis. Um, so if you look at the evidence for high flow bronchiolitis, that's just quite interesting because it's gone through many different waves. Uh, initially, there was a lot of excitement about high flow, um, but there was this Cochrane review in 2014, which kind of poured cold water on everything and said that there was insufficient evidence to determine the effectiveness of high flow therapy, but if you actually read the actual Cochrane Review article, it was actually just based on one RCT, which was just a pilot study with 19 participants. Uh, and they, that study compared the high flow therapy with oxygen delivery in the head box. So because this was in 2014, there wasn't any real RCT studies available yet. And even the authors uh, concluded in that review um, that further research was required. Um, so since then, there's actually been two really high quality RCT trials that have been published in Australia. Uh, they both came up with a very similar conclusions in terms of what kind of benefit high flow can provide and the size of that benefit as well. Uh, so both of the RCTs looked at kids with mild to moderate uh, bronchiolitis and though not those with like severe bronchiolitis that would be admitted directly to PICU. Uh, they excluded patients with impending respiratory failure uh, those who had uh, any obvious airway abnormalities or some other contraindication to treatment. Um, and both of them looked into high flow in the inpatient setting, not the emerge or ICU setting. Uh, and in both studies, they randomized patients into two treatment groups. So the first treatment group is the standard of care, which was initially treated with nasal cannulas. And the treatment group was uh, treated with a uh, high flow. So what was different between the two studies is that the flow rates for the nasal cannulas weren't standardized. Uh, so because of time sake, I'm not gonna go over into too much detail about the results, but I wanted to highlight the take home points from both studies. So the first take home point was that both studies have concluded that high flow is safe to use in bronchiolytic patients. Uh, 
Uh, the second take-home point is that both studies decreased, um, showed decrease in what they call treatment failure. So that's the uh, transfer to ICU or higher level care. And both studies found a reduction of treatment failure of roughly 60% using high flow, and the number needed to treat was five to 10. Um, and the third take-home point, and probably the most relevant for us in the MERGE setting, is that the conclusion that high flow uh, may be used as a rescue therapy if patients fail standard oxygen therapy. Uh, and I think this is relevant for us because in real life, we're not going to be like the researchers. We're not going to be randomizing patients to high flow or nasal prongs. We'd only start high flow on patients who fail nasal prongs or patients who we, didn't, don't, have, who we don't think would succeed on nasal prongs. So one of the, these trials looked into patients who failed nasal prongs and they got switched over to high flow. And what they found was that 60% of these patients did not need ex escalation of care. So what this says that is that high flow can be a really effective um, a rescue treatment. And this is how most of us is gonna be using this in our own practice. So coming back to uh, LHSC, uh, I chatted with the RTs and Dr. Punai and asked them when they would consider starting high flow uh, nasal cannula and bronchiolytics. Obviously there's no hard thresholds, a lot of it's clinical gestalt, uh, but failure uh, to oxygenate and increase uh, work of breathing are the two big ones. Um, and according to the RTs, uh, a general rule is that if a patient is less than a year old, uh, on one liter nasal prong and satting less than 94%, you probably want to start them on high flow, and, and you want to start them at one liter per kg per minute. And for patients who are older than one years old, you would want to start them on high flow if they're on three liters of nasal prongs with sats less than 95%. So the next uh, objective I'm going to cover uh, today is identifying the role of high flow in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in adults. Um, so the landmark paper you're going to see if you do your literature review on this is uh, was published in 2015 by Fratt et al. Uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, so in this paper, the author's clinical question was, in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure without hypercapnia, uh, does high flow oxygen therapy decrease intubation uh, and mortality rates compared to non-invasive ventilation or standard oxygen therapy? So uh, the authors in this study uh, concluded a multi-centered uh, RCT at 23 different ICUs across France and then across Belgium as well. And this was in 2011 to 2013. Um, their inclusion criteria was basically anyone who was working to breathe, uh, anyone who had a PF ratio of less than 300, uh, a PCACO2 of less than 45, and those who had no history of underlying chronic respiratory failure. Uh, they also had a huge list of exclusion criteria. Uh, basically, they had a very specific patient population in mind, uh, and that is those who had purely hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure. Um, so in this study, patients were randomized into three uh, treatment groups. Uh, so the first treatment group was standard oxygen. So patients uh, received non-rebreather mask at greater than 10 liters per minute. Uh, in the high flow uh, category, uh, patients received 50 liters per minute starting 100% FiO2. And in the non-invasive ventilation group, uh, patients uh, received a face mask that was connected to a ventilator with uh, pressure support. So the primary outcome uh, of this study was the proportion of patients who required intubation within 28 days after randomization. And the secondary outcomes were mortality in the ICU and 90-day mortality, uh, the number of ventilator-free days between day one and day 28, and the duration of the ICU stay. Um, so the results, uh, they, the authors found that the patients were quite homogenous across the uh, different treatment groups. The average age was roughly 60 years old and 64% uh, patients, percent of patients with uh, respiratory failure were caused by community acquired pneumonia. Uh, so in terms of uh, intubation uh, rates across the three treatment groups, uh, there was no statistical uh, difference between three groups. But if you look closer at the percentage I highlighted in uh, red here of people intubated, uh, there appears to be a trend that those on high flow had lower intubation rates. Uh, 
Uh, so in addition, the authors actually conducted a post-hoc analysis and they found that there was a statistical significance when you compared the intubation rates of patients with a PF ratio of less than 200, uh, such that the high flow group had uh, lower uh, rates of intubation. So 35% versus 58%. Uh, versus the 52% with standard oxygen. Uh, so in terms of their secondary outcomes, the authors found that the patients on high flow had a lower percentage of ICU mortality, lower 90-day mortality percentage, and higher highest number of uh, ventilator-free days. So the bottom line of the study uh, is that high flow nasal cannula, cannula is non-inferior uh, to non-rebreather masks and BiPAP in reducing the subsequent need for intubation for patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure in the ICU setting. Uh, and they also the authors concluded that the high flow nasal cannula can reduce uh, ICU and uh, 90 day mortality rates as well. Uh, so for me, what I think is most interesting part of COVID uh, from a medical perspective has been kind of seeing how our management keeps on changing. So currently the standard of care for all COVID patients uh, in the CCTC and MSICU is to prone them, to give them DEX and to use high flow. And the reason behind proning is to correct the VQ mismatch. The reason behind giving DEX is to decrease the inflama infl inflammation response, especially in the lungs. Uh, and the reasoning behind the high flow is initially that is that initially COVID is primarily an oxygenation problem, not a ventilation issue. And like I discussed earlier, high flow is great for treating hypoxemic respiratory failure and reducing the, maybe a subset of patients uh, from being intubated as well. So when I did my literature review on COVID, it was kind of challenging because there seems to be new studies popping up every single week. Um, so the best systematic review article I found on high flow in COVID patients. Uh, was accepted in May and published in June. And actually one of the authors you can see here is Dr. Basmaji, who is an intensivist here at LHSC. Uh, so in this article, the authors actually performed two systematic reviews. Uh, one of them looked at the effectiveness of high flow in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And the other looked at the dispersion aerosolization of high flow, which is obviously a hot topic in eMERGE setting nowadays. So I guess it's important to emphasize that the biggest limitation of this review uh, is that none of the eligible studies actually directly evaluated high flow in COVID patients. And for me, that's understandable because the study was actually accepted for publication in May, and that's like three months after the COVID was declared a pandemic. So there obviously wasn't enough studies out there, enough uh, to do a good uh, systematic review. So the authors, um, at least in the first review, looked at 12 RCTs um, and concluded that high flow may reduce invasive uh, ventilation and escalation of oxygen therapy. They also did not find uh, support for any differences in mortality or in hospital ICU length of stay. Uh, in their second systematic review, they looked at the dispersion and aerosolization of high flow. Um, they enrolled seven studies, four looked at the droplet dispersion, and three looked at aerosolization. So in terms of droplet dispersion, two uh, simulation studies and a crossover study showed mixed findings, and the authors could not make any conclusions whether high flow significantly increased droplet dispersion. And in terms of aerosolization, um, two, simulations, two sim studies were reported and showed no significant increased aerosolization of high flow. And one study uh, reported that higher flow rates were associated with larger volume of aerosolization. But again, the authors in this review cautioned that uh, any findings should be taken with a grain of salt, given that these studies did not directly evaluate um, aerosolization or droplet dispersion in COVID patients. Uh, so this is a table actually found at the BC Center of uh, Disease uh, Control uh, website. And I thought it was quite interesting because it's a great visual comparison in terms of the max aerosol dispersion between oxygen delivery devices. So these numbers are all published in various papers by Huey et al., which is also referenced in that systematic review I just mentioned. Again, it's kind of difficult to generalize the findings from a SIM model to a real life patient with COVID on high flow, but I thought it was interesting to see the differences between high flow compared to the other modalities like nasal cannula. Um, so the authors in that Huey et al. study believe that the high flow was less aerosolizing and their hypothesis was basically firstly, nasal cannula interface, the one that used in high flow made a tighter fit against the nose. So there was a much less leakage in addition, uh, they hypothesized that the air humidification effect uh, produced by the high flow would actually generate larger droplets on exhalation with a shorter trajectory path uh, due to the effect of gravity. 
So bottom line is basically uh, on the systematic review, no direct evidence applicable to COVID uh, was available. Uh, more studies need to be done um, to validate high flow in COVID patients. Uh, but high flow can, may substantially reduce the need for escalation of therapy to uh, NIV or intubation uh, with comparable complications and no effect to more, uh, on mortality. And there's mixed findings in terms of um, droplet dispersion and aerosol generation. Um, so for my last objective today, I'm going to be uh, going over high flow in other applications, but because of the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on apneic oxygenation uh, because I think that's the most relevant to the merge setting. Uh, so the most recent systematic review and meta-analysis I could find on this topic was just published back in February in the scientific reports. Um, and the authors in this review wanted to assess the clinical efficacy of high flow therapy as aptic oxygenation in patients who required intubation. Um, and they included studies that were RCT or prospective non-randomized studies. Uh, and they wanted patients in these studies to be either receiving high flow or uh, standard of care during apneic period of intubation. And the authors defined standard of care as no management or nasal cannulas or simple face masks or even venturi masks during intubation. So the major outcomes measures included uh, incidence of severe hypoxemia during intubation, uh, the mean lowest oxygen saturation during intubation, ICU length of stay, and in the hospital mortality. Uh, so the author started off with close to 250 studies and they, they narrowed it down to seven studies. Uh, in total, they have roughly 1,000 patients, roughly 500 uh, received high flow and roughly 450 received uh, standard of care. Uh, so in terms of major outcomes, uh, they did not find any statistical difference in terms of incidence of severe hypoxemia, uh, the mean lowest O2 sat and in, in, in hospital mortality. Uh, what they did find was that patients who received high flow during apneic oxygenation had a shorter length of ICU stay. Um, the authors also did uh, further analysis and they found that in patients who initially presented with mild hypoxemia, high flow used during the apneic oxygenation lowers the incidence of severe hypoxemia. Uh, and in terms of secondary outcomes, unfortunately, the authors did not find any significant differences. So in terms of uh, the bottom line of this uh, study, uh, the authors concluded that firstly, high flow nasal cannula significantly reduced the length of ICU stay. Uh, secondly, high flow was non-inferior to standard of care with respect to incidence of severe hypoxemia, the mean lowest oxygen saturation during intubation, in hospital mortality and other minor outcomes. Uh, lastly, high flow was effective in reducing the incidence of severe hypoxemia during intubation in patients with mild hypoxemia. So what I found interesting uh, when I read through the author's conclusion uh, portion is that they actually talked about an ongoing study called the pre airway trial, which is a multi-center RCT that is being done specifically in the merge setting. So this is actually quite rare because all the studies I've seen have been done in the ICU setting. So it's a study that I think I'm, we should keep tabs on uh, because once it's published, hopefully it'll give us a better sense of how effective high flow nasal cannula can be during RSI uh, in the ER setting. So in terms of uh, my final conclusions uh, of this uh, talk here this morning, um, so I know I went through a lot of information uh, over the last hour or so, um, but if I were to uh, summarize this presentation to five take-home points, so firstly, um, there are many benefits of high flow, including humidity, uh, matching inspiratory demands, uh, increasing the functional residual capacity, increasing comfort, uh, decreased O2 dilution, and wash out dead space. Um, the second take home point I want to kind of emphasize is that um, high flow is well studied and widely used in children with bronchiolitis, especially here at LHSC. Um, third point is that uh, in general, apneic oxygenation by high flow is non inferior to a uh, standard of care. And uh, fourthly, uh, for patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, high flow is non inferior to other modalities and may reduce the need for escalation of therapy and intubation. And I guess for me, this is where I believe as eMERGE docs, we can make the biggest impact on our patient's clinical trajectory. Uh, because by starting high flow instead of intubating certain patients, we could potentially keep patients out of the ICU setting. Uh, 
and all the associated long-term complications that an ICU admission can cause. Like for example, patients who are intubated uh, in the ICU lose roughly two to 3% of their muscle mass each day. Uh, and every day you spend intubated in the ICU, you, it takes roughly like three to four days to recover. And I guess this leads to my final take home points. Um, currently starting high flow in eMERGE at LHSD still requires critical care approval, but changes may be coming in the future to allow um, patients to be transferred to the floor and make it easier for us to start high flow in uh, eMERGE for certain patients. So I guess before I open it up for discussion, just wanna thank all the people who helped me uh, with this presentation, uh, specifically uh, Dr. Fotheringham, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Punai, Michelle Stevens, who is the senior registered RT for the adults, uh, and um, Brian Trudeau, who is the senior RT uh, for pediatric at uh, the side. So I guess I'll open up for discussion. Um, I posted the discussion slide I said earlier. I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, it's Mason, I have a question. Um, I just kind of quickly saw the algorithm there that you were flipping through, and it seems like if someone's failing high flow, uh, the recommendation would be to go to intubation. Is there a reason for that versus um, going to BiPAP or CPAP? Because if oxygenation is a problem, won't some additional PEEP really be the solution rather than putting a, cord, a tube through their, uh, their cords? Can, can you repeat that question? Like, again, sorry, I could cut off for a second. Right, okay, I, I, yeah. Um, let me turn my volume down here. Uh, so uh, you had said that, that, yeah, so down here it says the decision is to intubate if they're failing high flow. Why is it intubated as opposed to non-invasive ventilation? Because to me, the solution would be more PEEP rather than that cord through the tubes necessarily. Um, or uh, that's a great question. I, I think this was designed in COVID um, in mind. So I guess like with COVID, it's not just an oxygenation problem. Sometimes it could be a ventilation issue as well, especially if, if you get fibrosis, you get ARDS. Um, so I guess in this case, um, high flows, as you remember, is just an oxygen delivery device. So you probably want a natural, like maybe more, um, ventil ventilation, um, uh, properties. And I guess that's what intubation allows you to do as well. That's my guess. Uh, but maybe someone from, um, um, critical care could chime in if there's anyone here. Quiet group today. Yeah, I guess maybe something to look into. I mean, if this becomes more widely accepted, what would be the algorithm? Would you go from this right to intubation or would you stop at NIV along the way and see if that's kind of a step up from here, even because it adds the ventilation and the PEEP? But fair enough, I guess we don't have the answer on this call. Mm -hmm. If I recall, it had something to do with uh, aerosolizing the virus. This, this algorithm was created with COVID in mind. And I think they wanted to minimize um, non-invasive ventilation for that and go directly to intubation to minimize exposure. Okay, so for non-COVID issues, then it might be reasonable to go from high flow to BiPAP if, if indicated. Right, and I think we were uh, assuming that everybody had COVID in terms of treatment in the emergency department. I see, okay. Perfect, uh, so if anyone doesn't, if there's no more questions, I guess, we'll, I guess, end this talk early and we'll give a couple minutes. Um, for 10 o'clock teaching for the plus one residents. Hey, Lawrence, hey. Uh, Dave Borden here. Realistically, how long do you think it would take to get a patient set up and going on high flow if we had you know, the perfect candidate for this in the department? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I've heard that usually, 
it depends on like where you're working and like the time of the day. But like I heard that RTs can bring down the high flow from um, from upstairs usually within ten to fifteen minutes. So, uh, but I think the the barrier, like I said before, the challenge is you usually have to get a critical care on board uh, before you can start high flow. So I think that's another barrier that hopefully with um, uh, changes in policy, we can expedite things and start um, people on high flow much quicker. So with that in mind, does your first call have to go to CCTC or can you, you know, talk to RT directly and have them getting started with that? So what I heard, at least uh, from talking to some of the RTs, is that it depends on the RT. Some RTs would want you to call critical care first, and that's usually the policy. But there are RTs out there who will bring it down uh, just if you want it, and then you would call um, critical care later. But the critical care has to be involved at some point in time at least presently right now um i've had a couple of experiences uh and i find it very rt dependent um it can happen as you said within 10 or 15 minutes um and some rts will readily go get it and do whatever they need to do to get permission and then other rts are very hesitant so i think your comments are exactly right that's from my experience what's happened it, it's sort of a bit variable at this point Perfect. Um, so I guess thanks everyone again for uh, coming to my talk. Um, hopefully uh, this was uh, helpful and uh, hopefully we'll see more changes in the future then. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you.